Welcome back to uh, the Brazilian American Chambers Economic Conference. Once again, I am John Welch, Executive Director of the BACC. Now we move on to the two-part panel, looking at the economic and political outlook. Our moderator today is my colleague and friend, Paulo Vieira da Cunha of Verbank Consulting. Paulo has, has held various positions on Wall Street. He was Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Brazil, held various positions at the World Bank, the IMF, and earlier in his career in the Brazilian government, research institutes, and universities. He is a director of the Brazilian American Chamber of Commerce and holds a PhD from the University of California at Berkeley. You can find Paulo's full bio and those of all the panelists on the reminder that was sent yesterday on the VA and also on the VACC website. Again, before turning it over the screen over to Paulo, I would ask that you please use the Q&A tab for questions. You can make them at any time and we will look to answer them after the panel discussion during the Q&A period. Thank you. Without further ado, I will turn the screen over to Paulo. Paulo? Good morning. Can you can you hear me, everyone? Yes, it's fine. Okay. Well, welcome and um, and thank you for tuning in to this event with this extraordinary roster of analysts of, of the Brazilian um, economy and politics. Uh, first, a, a word on how we'll proceed. Uh, we'll start with uh, four brief presentations about the macroeconomy. Uh, Roberto Sesimski from Barclays in New York, Marcelo Furi from the Fundação Getúlio Vargas in São Paulo, Zeina Latif from Gibraltar Consultoria in São Paulo, Lisa Chinella from the S&P Ratings here in New York. We will then take a, a very short break, five minutes or less, um, just so we can stretch our legs and get out a bit and then return to talk about um, the hot stuff, markets and politics, uh, with uh, Danny Tenengauser from BNY Mellon here in New York, uh, José Carlos Carvalho from Vinci Partners in Rio de Janeiro and in Sao Paulo as well, and Chris Garman from Eurasia uh, in Sao Paulo, in Washington, D.C., in New York. Chris is everywhere. So um, uh, this uh, will conclude the presentations. We will then have a very short uh, uh, interaction within the panel to give the panel uh, a chance to, to comment on what they've heard um, and, and amend whatever they said if they want to. Um, and then uh, we'll have uh, open up for Q&A and our aim is to finish uh, by 2 p.m. Uh, New York time. Um, this is a very distinguished group uh, with a very long list of accolades and credentials. And um, as John said, uh, we will not read their bios, uh, but you can consult um, on, on, on the website and, and um, you'll be impressed. Um, now, uh, just to set the scene a little bit before Roberto begins to delve in, um, as um, as president of the BNDS, Gustavo Montezano was saying, but by all accounts, uh, the worst of the uh, COVID um, impact on the Brazilian economy was, was in April. And a number of measures have helped sustain uh, family incomes and consumption, especially among the poor. These measures uh, cost nearly 12% of GDP by the IMF. Brazil was one of the emerging countries that uh, did the largest programs, six and a half percent of GDP from the government budget and 5.4% uh, of GDP from central bank, BNDS and private banks uh, liquidity in one way or another through directed lending. Uh, as uh, Gustavo Montezano said, that had a big impact. As a result, uh, the drop in GDP will be limited likely this year to 5% or, or, or less and the drop in personal incomes will be smaller than in recent crises, even, even those uh, with a larger supply side effects. Uh, that, that is quite an achievement. The problem is, is how to keep this going. Unemployment is still very high. Uh, today, uh, someone has estimated that the unemployment rate would be 24% if the participation rate uh, had stayed stable since July of last year. Um, and the pace of growth is not rapid enough to support consumption. 
it cannot generate uh, the volume of revenues the government needs to stay afloat. Uh, public debt will reach 100% of GDP or more by the end of the year. And it will have grown 20 percentage points or more in just 2020. The debt uh, is on an unsustainable path and the market is showing signs that it may bo boycott a continuation of current trends. At issue is how to fund a continued program of income support without breaking the expenditure ceiling law that is today the only guardian of fiscal credibility. Meanwhile, discussions about possible ways out are on hold until after the municipal elections. Given the chaotic state of play in the administration and its relations with Congress, promises of deep structural reforms are not realistic as much as they are needed, as we just heard Gustavo Montesano say. Anyway, it's an unsavory mix, but for us, it's a very good time uh, to have this debate. So let's go ahead, let's start, and I will uh, begin with Roberto, please. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Paulo and John, for a kind invitation. It's my pleasure to be here with you today in the 2020 Brazil Economic Conference. Uh, I think, Paulo, you said basically everything. Like th That's basically where <laughs> we stand now and the, the, the the, the critical issues to be faced in the coming weeks and months. Uh, but uh, I'm going to try to give just a, a macro overview. Uh, part There will be some overlapping with uh, the, the things that you defined so well just now. But basically, Brazil during the pandemic has spent a lot. Uh, we are seeing some results. It is paying off to some extent, but the bill is coming due. And I'm going to try to break it down and just, just give a brief overview on how that all happened. Not to give too many numbers, but as Paulo was saying, like we estimate at Barclays that Brazil committed in terms of budget resources, just fiscal only, about 8.5% of GDP or 600 billion reais extra uh, just to, to deal with the pandemic and its uh, disruptions. Um, and this is more than Germany has. This is only behind uh, what the US, Canada, and Japan have done. Uh, this is much, much more than basically all emerging uh, market economies have done. And unfortunately, Brazil doesn't share the same level of fiscal credibility as, as Germany or, or Canada do, for example. So, uh, but, but it is paying back in the sense that uh, while at Barclays, we expect the, the regional GDP in Latin America to contract about 7% this year, with uh, some other economies doing uh, poorly, for example, Mexico contracting 9%, Argentina 11%, Peru maybe even 13%. In Brazil, we expect the economy to contract only 4.4%. Uh, this was recently revised um, uh, from minus five. The, the, the most negative that we were along the way was minus 5.7 a couple months ago. Uh, but even then, like we, we know that other institutions or the IMF itself went as far as expecting a 9% contraction. So by all means, the money deployed uh, into the economy it is working. It, it is uh, allowing uh, a, a faster than initially anticipated recovery in sectors of the economy. It is an uneven recovery. Uh, some areas, it looks like a V-shaped, others not so much. Uh, but uh, as Paulo was saying, it is a fact that the emergency benefit to informal workers that uh, in Brazil we call Corona Voucher which is almost 5% of GDP, that, that is a lot of money. And that has more than made up for the decline in, in, in the wage mass. And the ways that we're seeing that is, for example, with the significant uptick in retail sales. If we look and compare where we were now in August versus in February, just before the pandemic, retail sales in August were already 8% above pre-pandemic levels. Uh, supermarket sales, 6% up. Uh, and particularly furniture and household appliances up 24%, construction inputs 19%, all versus February. So that is a significant jump, in particular in this moment where we do have unemployment on the rise. If it were not for uh, the decline in the participation rate, numbers would be much, much uglier than they are, as Paulo was mentioning as well. Um, and but the fact that uh, the, those fiscal resources were put in place have largely cushioned 
the blow uh, in, in certain segments of the economy, for example, in retail sales, as I was pointing out. And as a result, we do see industrial production uh, coming back. It's also an even like capital goods lagging, of course, but uh, intermediate goods and even some durable ones uh, coming back uh, close to pre-pandemic levels. And uh, services is, is lagging understandably so because of the, the nature of the disruptions, for example, in entertainment or, or restaurants or tourism, for example. So these activities will take longer. And that is not a surprise. I think the surprise has been the, 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 the speed at which uh, the, the bounce back is happening in, in, in certain segments, as I was saying. Um, so it, it is working for now, right? Uh, it has spent a lot, it is getting some results. Um, in, in terms of inflation, we started to see uh, a little bit of a rebound. Part of it is a global phenomenon related to food stuff. Uh, in the case of Brazil, specifically, um, exports to China in a very weak, like a much weaker BRL and exchange rate are being uh, uh, reflected in wholesale prices. And we're seeing uh, some of that pass through happening to, to, to retail prices as well. Um, and uh, for, we expect for this year inflation at 2.8%, but we, we expect inflation this year at 2.8% for next year 3.4, but even then well below the central bank's target uh, for inflation that is 4% this year, 375 next year. But uh, we're, starting to, we're starting to see some responses there. So um, the, 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 the vital signs, as Minister Paulo Guedes likes to call, uh, they're there. The economy is alive and we're seeing uh, a, a recovery. Um, there is some question on the sustainability of that recovery once you unwind that um, a fiscal stimulus that is in place. Although we are hearing the, about intentions from the government to, to, to basically um, uh, migrate from the emergency benefit and, and transition into a, a permanent welfare uh, a benefit. Uh, we, we don't have details yet on, on, on the scope of it, like how many more million would be actually included, uh, what the increase in the average ticket would be, how much these extra families and, and, and all the ones already in the Bolsa Familia program would be receiving. But what we do know is that there's very little, if any, money to, 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 to pay for that. And that's when I say that the bill is coming due. And, and that means for this year, we're going to see the fiscal primary um, uh, balance, uh, the deficit reach uh, uh, more than 12%, in nominal terms, 16%, if we include interest payments. Um, and, and that is pushing uh, public debt, uh, gross public debt significantly up from about 76% to 93%, we estimate this year. Again, in this case, Brazil at the top of, of most, uh, lar among the large EMs, like the one with the highest debt load, they are now with the 93% that will continue to increase for next year. So, um, the situation then is like how to find resources to, to keep this going because demonstration of fiscal credibility will be key. Not, not only demonstration, but commitment to fiscal um, consolidation will be key in ensuring that uh, the financing of these very large numbers that I just quoted will, will be there. Um, we, as Paulo mentioned, uh, President Bolsonaro put discussions on hold until after the elections, the municipal elections scheduled for next month. Um, unfortunately, time is against uh, the, 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 the fiscal plans because we don't even have like the, the budget guidelines law that was uh, meant to be approved back in July was never voted. Uh, we don't even have a, a, a budget committee installed in Congress yet to start discussing the guidelines that were presented in April or the budget that was presented in, in August. So uh, time is really running out in the sense that we might only have three or four weeks before the end of um, 2020 and without knowing what decision will be made in terms of that transition away from the emergency benefit into a potential new program. And, and we could have a discontinuity there while unemployment remains high and, and, and that could have an adverse effect on growth, but there's no easy choice here because uh, as I mentioned, since the spending cap is now binding for any uh, mandatory, uh, for any uh, expenses to increase, others would have to be curtailed. It should be a zero sum game. That's precisely why the spending cap was created to prevent the indefinite growth 
of, of, of uh, public spending. And, and that's uh, now that the cap is finally binding, this, this is the true test on uh, whether the, the, the government and Congress will uh, cut spending as, 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 as the cap, uh, the, the legislation basically requires to, or if a new Jeijing, like if, if, if a new way will be found around the cap. And uh, this, is, this, is, this is part of the, the, the challenge. There's no room for error, as I mentioned before, in terms of the financing, the treasury has already experienced some difficulties in rolling over debt. Just to give a little bit of perspective, over the next 12 months, almost a quarter of all the treasury's debt will be up for um, being rolled over. That's about 950 billion reais. If we include the central bank's uh, repo operations, the compromisadas that also use treasury bonds, then we're talking about like 33% of GDP in the next 12 months being rolled over. That's 2.4 trillion reais. And this 33% of GDP now for the next 12 months compares to 25% a year ago. So the, the numbers are typically high. This is much higher than before, but the crucial aspect here is whether the fiscal anchor will be respected. Um, Brazil used to have like three different rules on fiscal, the, the golden rule that is broken, the, 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 the primary balance target that doesn't really apply anymore because it's a residual from revenues minus the cap, and the spending cap, which is the last one standing. So it'll be very important to see in the coming weeks what kind of, 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 of a debate and in what direction uh, the decisions will really had to. A couple of weeks ago, we had some discussion, some creative discussion on, on, on meddling with the, the, the payment of precatorios mm -hmm. or maybe the funded, the things that uh, seem like a, a bypass around the cap that caused market concern. Uh, and, and, and that's why like the, the question is pretty much up in the air and there could be very uh, important consequences to, to, to those decisions yet to be made. Um, and as I was saying, like there, there's a lot of debt to be rolled over and, and, and this could create additional difficulties for, for, for the treasury. There has been a debate in Brazil whether we reach the effective lower bound or not. This was a discussion presented by the central bank from an inflation targeting point of view, not necessarily, as I mentioned before, the forecasts remain below the target, but from a financing point of view, from the treasury's perspective and the difficulties that we've seen uh, when the treasury try to place LFTs, those bonds linked to the Silic rate being sold at a discount, uh, one could make the case that uh, we, we might have gone past that point, at least uh, while the fiscal uncertainty remains and, and, and basically causes the, the market to demand higher risk premium. Um, so again, these, the, the, the answers uh, are not easy to be reached. They will require potentially unpopular measures in terms of cutting back expenditures elsewhere if the new welfare program is to be created indeed. But just to conclude, I, I think like not to lose sight of, of, of the structural part is that the, the the, the, the best uh, way of addressing these fiscal concerns would ideally be through growth, economic growth, right? Because we know that even respecting the spending cap, that alone would not restore primary surpluses. So that alone is not a guarantee that we would eventually see uh, consolidation of, of, of public debt. The real way to, to get out of this is persisting on structural reforms. And, we, we need to see advancements in tax reform to reduce the, the, the red tape and, and, and the cost of doing business in Brazil. We need to see advancements in the administrative reform to, to reduce uh, mandatory spending with uh, personnel and civil servants. And, and again, the timing of those remains highly uncertain. And, and there's so much to do in the very short term just to ensure that the fiscal anchor is not lost. But keeping in mind that uh, for next year it will be crucial to persist on the path of reforms because uh, just before the pandemic, we estimated that Brazil's potential growth was actually below 1%. We don't think it has changed much since. I know, thank and you. That will be uh, the, the, the next chapter uh, past, past the short-term challenges. We still have uh, very big ones uh, to tackle next year. Thank you, thank you, uh, Roberto, very much. This was a, an excellent introduction. And, and as you say, I mean, uh, we, we have a challenge 
an immediate challenge that could uh, create a, an impasse over the funding. And then uh, if we recall, um, when we've been discussing this since last many years, actually, productivity growth in Brazil is very low. Uh, the structure of supply seems to be damaged. And, and we don't really know what happened very much during this pandemic. But we are very, very happy to have with us someone who might know something about this and who might uh, uh, help us understand what's happening um, more on, on, on the growth side and in terms of how that links uh, uh, to monetary policy and, and other uh, policy options. So it's a pleasure to introduce Marcelo. If you, if you could talk now for about 10, 12 minutes, please. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Paulo, for inviting me. And, uh, as Paulo said, I want to focus more on monetary policy. It has been my specialty on the last 25 years. So uh, a bit of motivation. I mean, since the real plan in 94, when you conquer low inflation, you haven't uh, tackled two problems. The, I mean, there is two collateral, collateral damage on the real plan. The increase in tax uh, rate and the very high interest rate. So at least one of these problems is kind of solved temporarily or permanently. I'm gonna discuss this a, a bit more. So for the first time, I'm seeing real interest rate on the negative term. So right now that central bank just finished the easing cycle, say look at 2%. I like to measure real interest rate using the 306 day swap PDI and deflated that by the 12 months ahead inflation expectation. So on that measure, it was just below zero. And you were at three, four, three fourths, 0.75 below on, the, on June. So it has been an increase lately on the, on the, on the real interest rate, okay? So, uh, I, and I resume uh, uh, some studies that I have been done and when I was a central bank on, on measure that equilibrium interest rate for Brazil. So I was 11 years then in Citibank. And then when I went back to the academy a couple of days, a couple of years ago, I resumed that study and I just put on, on my, uh, on the website of GV, two papers on measuring the equilibrium rates. One, use three, tech, three econometric techniques to measure it. And the other one is the DSG model. DSG model is a general equilibrium model, is partially calibrated, partially estimated using uh, Bayesian econometrics. It's kind of fancy stuff, but I, I'm gonna comment more on the, the first one. And on top of the equilibrium rates, I calculate a, a Taylor rule for Brazil. That's a mechanical rule that you said the monetary policy in regards to how high or low is the inflation expectation in regards to the target and if the uh, out, uh, output gap is positive or negative, okay? So, the, and then I, I couldn't resist and I'm gonna bring a, a picture for you with uh, the three uh, lines. One is a definitive interest rate. The other one is the Taylor rule and the third is the, the average of the equilibrium room, the equilibrium interest rate that I just said, okay? So uh, let me, me point it. Okay, this is, are you seeing my picture? So yes. the, the, the blue line, as I said, is the effective interest rate. The orange one that's kind of a more stable is the average of the equilibrium rates. It, it, the green one, no, sorry, the, the orange is the Taylor rate and, uh, and the, the green is the equilibrium rate. So here, you look here on the first term of Duma, when the central bank kind of did a more uh, dovish stance, you, you can see here that the effective rate was below the, the, the Taylor rule and the equilibrium rate. After that, you see the reversal with a more hawkish tone and that kind of uh, contribute to worsening the recession. And lately, you see that um, this is the Taylor room. It's uh, as Roberto said, if you, you use only the, the gap and uh, what is the expectation for inflation next year, uh, 
the interest rate could be even lower than it is right now. So the, this is the effective rate at close to the zero, okay? So this is the, uh, I mean, I think it's kind of in, interesting to, to analyze uh, this picture. And this picture show that indeed you have uh, accommodative monetary policy, a loose monetary policy. The effective rate is 200, 300 basis points below my calculation of the equilibrium rate, okay? So uh, indeed it's a um, loose monetary policy and uh, could be even looser if you don't have a uh, fiscal stand, a fiscal risk moving up. And, and that is the, why I think the since June it's increasing and that's why the central bank is not, was not able to go on cutting, okay? So a uh, central bank is trying to, to give a message that monetary policy will be accommodative in the next term because inflation is below uh, the, the target for 2021, as, as Roberto mentioned, has forecast is a bit higher than the central bank wants for next year, but it's still, it's still okay. But uh, if you see for this year, the uh, inflation forecast is kind of higher. It's not high, no, sorry, it's increasing. A couple of months ago, everyone uh, thought that the central bank would have uh, to write a new letter, a new open letter to central banks saying that what, what, what were the reasons to justify why they breached the inflation from below the target. And looks like it's not be the case anymore. The uh, inflation is picking up a bit in the short term. I'm gonna discuss uh, that a little bit. So now I'm gonna show you this, my second picture very briefly, okay? This is how I think it's the, the best way to measure Brazilian risk right now. You see, this is the, the gray line is the slope of the yield curve in, in January before the pandemic. And see, in June, you have, uh, the, the curve was a little bit already a step, a, a steeper than uh, before. Now in September is much more. So the difference from six months and 10 years is five uh, percentage points right now. And before the pandemic, this difference was 200 points on, 200 basis points on. So that's the best way to measure risk now in Brazil. CDS five years or AMB is not the way to measure risk because those are uh, measures for the, um, the standard debt. And what bothers us is not the external debt, but the internal debt, okay? So let me go to for the second uh, part of my, of my, my talk. Very briefly, is this new monetary policy for good or is it going to be temporary? I mean, the, the risk is there. I mean, Roberto elaborated a lot on, on that. I think uh, Zena will talking about that, Liz. I'm not a specialist on the fiscal, but uh, I can say that uh, I agree with Roberto and I think the, the central bank made uh, uh, overcut the Selic rate. And the signs of that is the the discount on LFT auctions. This, the, 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 the last time that I remember that happened was in 2002, one Lula where was elected and everyone was really worried about uh, the, the next term. So it's the second time in the 20 years that that happened and sign that something odd is going on. So it's as, as I already mentioned, that the trade has been difficult to to finance the, the debt. So they sh sh shorter a lot the maturity of the debt. And the next four months, 2021, 6 billion reais has to be renewed. I, I think it's a different number that Roberto just said. So this is kind of a, the big risk right now is what's going on on, on, the, on the fiscal next year. Another thing is this dual growth. As Roberto mentioned, everyone is observing that Retail sales and industrial production is growing at a very good pace, but service is lagging. So and it's kind of normal uh, on this because uh, you cannot uh, put people together. And, and inflation is reflect that number with kind of uh, uh, this average with, uh, with the shock of foods uh, also on the top of that commodities as well. So you see food very high level service at low level, so the average is still okay. And I think uh, monitor price, utility price 
are still at bay as well. So it's helping to, to control inflation. But you haven't seen a kind of uh, a bit of pass through already. Okay. And, um, and that pass through is, is still okay, but that will depend what's going on with the fiscal and the, with the growth next year. If you see service leveling off with, with other uh, sectors, the pass through can uh, uh, increase a little bit. And another round of depreciation of BRL could add to this pass through and could put inflation at, the, at higher levels. And that's going to be impossible to central bank to, 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 to use an interest rate at 2%. So uh, th that is my, 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 my presentation. Uh, and thank you, Paul, Paul, again. OK. Thank you very much, Marcelo. That's, that's really very interesting. It's, it's, it's amazing how really uh, the neutral rate in Brazil has both fallen and, and how much the central bank has done recently uh, to operate below the neutral rate. And, and, and effectively, as, as both Roberto and you have emphasized uh, have already has already reached the effective lower bound in terms of it of the financing capacity of the treasury, but the financing capacity of the treasury is is still evolving. We really don't know because obviously uh, a lot depend on how they are going to close uh, the gap uh, for next year, um, and and we are delighted uh, that to have with us Zena Lachif. Uh, who has been following macro in Brazil very closely, and in particular has a, a great grip on, on the fiscal issue. So Zaina, thank you very much, and, and please go ahead. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here in this panel. So let me talk about the fiscal risk. So something that Roberto has already mentioned, we had a huge fiscal stimulus. According to the government, it's amounting to 10% of GDP just at the federal level. Uh, this print compares to what we saw in Germany, for example, and it's far above all the emerging uh, economies, which does not, of course, bode well for, bodes well for, for us because uh, the starting point for Brazil is the picture is pretty much ugly. So uh, we have much higher debt to GDP and, uh, and a, 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 a dynamic that was already concerning. Another thing is that the mix of, uh, economic, of fiscal policy was not the, the ideal one, in my opinion. It was uh, a bias, to, there was a bias towards uh, supporting households. Uh, almost half of this 10% of GDP was uh, due to uh, uh, this cash transfer program and less support to companies. Of course, in the short run, you have a significant impact on the economy, especially in Brazil, that, uh, that we see an important a pent up demand. So it's very easy to stimulate consumption in Brazil, household consumption. But the problem is that there is a trade-off here because the, I think a, a better mix uh, for supporting companies, although there was a, a big effort for that, but I think that would be ideal, especially because there are implications in terms of uh, medium to long-term growth and job creation. So, okay, uh, it was pretty much effective to, to stimulate the economy consumption, but there are costs involved. And, uh, and uh, uh, we, 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 we know that. We know that, uh, that, that uh, the, 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 the whole picture here, I mean, in terms of the amount of fiscal stimuli and the mix, I think that we could have uh, uh, you know, a, a better calibration, I would say, of this of this policy. It will take its toll uh, once the policy phase out, um, especially because we know that the companies will be struggling with difficult financial conditions. Well, um, we've been seeing uh, uh, some concerning discussions in Congress. Uh, I, th I think that the risk for postponing uh, there's a period that we call the public calamity period. I think the risk for postponing the end of this period uh, uh, is increasing, which means that government will, will, will be able to increase spending without compromising the spending cap. Uh, the idea in itself is not the problem. I think the problem is that you're doing that uh, without any other measure to reduce mandatory spending in Brazil. I'm referring here 
of course, to the uh, reduction in payrolls of public servants. So um, I, I see a risk of postponing this calamity period in order to, of course, uh, give further months, extra months for, for the, the emergency aid. But it's the way of, of gaining some time until they have a, a more solid proposal for Renda Cidadã, uh, the citizen income program. But the problem is that you do that without any compensation in terms of reducing, uh, reducing uh, mandatory spending. Uh, from what I see, the, the, the economy minister and the speaker of the lower house, they have been denying this possibility, but I see significant risks in Congress. Um, another point is that clearly the president is refusing any structural reform to cut mandatory spending. Uh, uh, we saw this proposal of administrative reform that was really timid. Uh, we, we see also uh, the president uh, denying the possibility of this consolidation of ineffective uh, social policies in order to amplify the Bolsa Familia program. So no, no structural reforms. And uh, this is why I, th I think that the risks for uh, even uh, uh, flexibilizing the spending cap also increased. Not now, but I think this is a big risk, a growing risk, uh, uh, especially for next year. Again, if you do that without any counterpart in terms of reforms, we will be impacting significantly the credibility of this instrument. It means that its effectiveness to keep the macro stability is reduced. Okay, we know that they will not just, you know, uh, forget the spending cap is not that, but any flexibilization means that uh, the instrument will not be so effective to coordinate expectations and keep macro stability. Uh, well, aside from all this discussion, uh, we have the, the risks or the risks there uh, around this new social program, uh, the problem of trying to find a funding for that. Uh, and and, and it, it, it's not included in the budget, of course. So uh, somehow this budget, this proposal of budget that was sent to Congress recently it's you know it's a kind of a fiction it's fairy tale it's not including all the risks that we see it's not only the hang the cidade but also other other factors that could impact the, the the budget for example the extension of tax breaks or tax exemptions on the payroll um, congress will be probably overriding the veto of the president and it has an impact of almost 5 billion reais for next year. So they, they, they need to find some room uh, in, in the budget in order to do with this extra spending. There is also a recent discussion about uh, this decoupling between inflation indices in Brazil, and meaning that though that, that index that uh, makes the adjustment is a, a reference for the adjustment of um, of, uh, of social security is running above the IPCA. Uh, so mean, meaning that we could also have extra spending due to that. The estimate that I saw is about 7 billion extra, 7 billion reais of extra spending for next year. So we have short-term issues, we have long-term issues, but the short-term are also really concerning. Uh, another point that I think we need to monitor really closely is the serious uh, problem, serious uh, crisis in, in states at the state level. Uh, I think this is a, a crisis that is about to burst. Uh, states, they somehow, they gained some time this year with the, with the pandemic. There was a big transfer of resources from, from federal government. Um, 125 billion reais when we take into account the money transfer and also the postponement of, uh, of uh, debt payments to the union. So it, it, it helped a lot, uh, but the problem is that this program is phasing out uh, and uh, the spending with healthcare will continue high. 
there are consequences about the FUNDEB, that fund for education, that will put a pressure on, 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 uh, on the payroll for subnationals. Uh, we'll probably be seeing uh, tax revenue su um, su suffering a lot once we have the end of uh, the emergency aid. We have this artificial recovery of the economy now, uh, which is helping to increase tax revenue, but this is something temporary. So next year, uh, the, the, there will be this challenge because uh, the, 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 the recovery of tax revenue will be much slower. And states and or subnationals, they need to resume the payments of debt to the union. So I think this is pretty much important because we are going to see growing pressure from subnationals on the treasury. There, there is now a discussion in Congress uh, about a debt re renegotiation. So it's not the Mansueto's plan is another one. Uh, and we should keep an eye. I, I see good intentions, but we know once a, a, a law is a, a measure is a, it starts to be approved in Congress, things could change a lot. We, set, we saw that by the end of 2016 when there was this debt renegotiation and all counterparts were, almost all counterparts were eliminated. So this time they are proposing, it's, it, this initiative is from the Congress, is not from, from uh, the executive. Um, another reason for keeping an eye because I see the, the economy uh, ministry kind of far from these discussions, which is concerning, let's see. But the point is they, they are proposing again a debt renegotiation and some transfer of resources to subnationals and as counterpart reforms, reforms like uh, pension reform for those states that haven't carried out the reform yet and, and also eliminating some tax breaks. Oh, to be honest with you, this kind of discussion of pension reform in states, reducing tax breaks, they need to do this. This is something that it's mandatory for states regardless of any, of any uh, proposal of, uh, of help from, from federal government. So this, this is really concerning. And we need to remember just, uh, just uh, the, the, the beginning of the year before the calamity uh, uh, period, we saw several states increasing payroll, increasing wages of public servants. So this is really concerning the situation because most of the states, not of all of them, uh, are just you know, kicking the can and not doing their job. And probably this, the pressure will be much bigger next year. So I, I think that we should monitor really closely the, risk com the risks coming from, from subnationals. Well, markets are reacting to that, which is positive um, because uh, it helps you know, to put pressure in Congress and even in, in the government. But for now, what we see is a, a lack uh, of a structured plan and for fiscal consolidation, the, 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 um, the picture before the crisis, as I said, was pretty much ugly. ugly. Things worsened really fast. We have all these costs of the pandemic. And there are some other uh, risks that uh, some of them I already mentioned, but I think it's important to highlight uh, this concern about um, judicial decisions in the latest, latest report of the Treasury, they are pointing that there is a risk of a big in, increase in government liabilities due to judicial um, decisions. And uh, what they call the possible risk, not probable, but possible risks, uh, they, the, the value exceeds a lot uh, the primary spending of the government. So the, this is why we see those precatorios rising so fast. And it's unacceptable, unacceptable the way that the government is just closing the eyes for those risks. So as it was not enough, this big risk from the, the or this cost from the pandemic and risks that we highlighted here, there are other extra risks when we don't see any movement from just from Ministry of Justice, of AGU. So this is really concerning. Um, so, so basically what I'm saying is that the picture for fiscal side next year, I think will be really, really uh, a picture of very high 
fiscal risks, and I don't see the government really prepared to deal with that. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zaina. I mean, um, really, it's it's a uh, it's a very sobering picture. I mean, we 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 heard from Marcelo that uh, interest rates won't uh, there won't be any more gain from the interest rate. And this has been a tremendous help. I mean, it came down from the funding cost of the government came down from above 12% to now around 4%, but it probably will begin to rise uh, or at least it won't fall. And then um, behind that uh, discussion, as, as you pointed out and behind the neutral rate of Marcellus is the fact that um, the output gap now is tremendous. It's, it's, it's May, maybe as, as big as 14%. Uh, but behind that output gap is a very low potential GDP growth for Brazil. Um, and, and that growth rate um, could be 2%, um, but it could be closer to zero. I mean, if some of the impacts on the supply side uh, have a more uh, uh, longer effect. So Lisa, as, as, as you begin to look at this, we, you've seen many fiscal crises in Brazil, uh, but, but we are looking at, a, at, a, at another very difficult one. And contrary, as Roberto said at the very outset, the best thing would be to grow out of it. But it doesn't look like that's, that's on the cards. And it doesn't look as if um, the government is seriously beginning to address uh, what, what is looking at, I mean, ultimately it will come down to a very large placement of new debt, and then we could have an impasse with the market. So uh, please, Lisa, help us understand all of this. Uh, th thanks so much, Paolo. <laughs> thanks, John, for the invitation. Um, thanks to the chamber as always. It's very hard to add anything following Roberto, Marcelo, and Zena. So just put that out there um, <laughs> and your comments, Paolo. So I think I'm gonna show a couple of graphs in a couple of minutes just to kind of highlight the, the, the challenges, right? But Brazil's fiscal challenges aren't new. I think that was my, gonna be my opening statement and, and as Paolo's highlighted that, right? If we think back, you know, from the rating perspective, Brazil, you know, moved to investment grade, it got as high as triple B, and then it's been moving downward since 2013. And, and a key piece of that, not the only piece, has been various fiscal dynamics, right? Um, we had a negative outlook on the triple B rating back in 2013, it lost investment grade in 2015. If you look at historically the overall size of the deficit, Four, less than four and three percent deficits, you know, at, at its best years, you know, with primary surpluses of say two to three, then the whole shift over the last decade really um, to consistent primary deficits. Um, and then maneuvering around net debt, you know, uh, which didn't rise as much, you know, comparatively speaking. Um, but you had it in the quality of policy during that period of time, what is the target, shifting of the target, the below the line associated with the quasi-fiscal of Vende S.A. And I think that provides a cautionary note here in terms of the global financial crisis, the, the policy response important to kind of help smooth that. At the same time, the challenges of withdrawal of a policy stimulus. And I think the global financial crisis particularly the off balance side and, and the, the length of duration of the using of the off balance side, off balance sheet piece of the quasi fiscal is really what weighed on market dynamics, impacted our assessment on the fiscal dynamics, et cetera. Um, so there's a long history here, right? Um, and then since then, you know, you had various growth in, in tax exemptions, which persist to, to in terms of degrading the integrity of, of the tax approach. Um, uh, then you had the swing in the demographics and the growth in social security, right? So there was less and less discretionary space. You were bumping up for the first time ever, the golden rule uh, several years ago that was always there, but none of us, or should say, I never knew about it for a very long time because it wasn't a relevant factor because you, had, you, you weren't, didn't have all these constraints binding at the same time. 
and you had a slowish political response. Broad brush, if you think of how long it took to think about a spending cap, and that was appropriately articulated under, under the Temer administration, finally passed. But our view was always that the cap in and of itself is not a solution, and you needed to then back it up with further reforms to be able to add flexibility to the spending piece. Social Security was one piece of that, and, and a first step finally done in, in, in 2019. But you're still talking, and I'll show a graph, a very high level still of pension spending weighing on the budget. So now we're moved today to talk about the other aspects of you know, administrative tax, the long, Zane and I have long uh, highlighted the local government pressures, et cetera. And now Paolo, as you highlight the tax composition, sorry, debt composition has always has been a strength in Brazil's rating um, as it migrated up the rating scale. It's shortened. So those pressures with the, today with the very high level of debt, that's a new dynamic or, or return as, as Marcella reminded us, kind of the, in terms of some of the complications. But I think with all of this, one needs to put into perspective, we're talking about these challenges around a double B minus rating, okay? And it's extremely complex globally to think about how and when to remove fiscal stimulus. And that's happening in the United States and it'll be happening you know, globally. So I, I think to, to echo the point that Roberto highlighted, it's very different, the starting, and, and Zena and, the starting point is very different. I'm going to share my screen for a moment, see if I can get that effectively up there. Um, are you seeing a chart? Yes. Right. Okay. So I think that the, the me message I would want to give here is yes, Brazil has a huge deficit this year. Okay. US has a huge deficit. So does India. The US is at double A plus, India is at triple B minus. Brazil sitting at double B minus. Argentina also has a pretty large deficit. It's also a triple C plus for various reasons. Um, so you have a significant response across the board. Brazil is sort of at the forefront in EM. Chile has a pretty big one as well, but it has a much lower debt level, right? So that's the next piece to highlight. What is the starting point? If we look at the, the, the right-hand side of the, of the charts, Brazil's debt, what is has jumped up and from the way we calculate it different than your 100 percent Paolo, but we're talking you know a huge jump you know some maybe 20 percentage points up to almost 80 percent in net general government terms this year us a huge jump india has a huge jump as well okay and but um and as we all know less so in mexico given the lack of a counter cyclical policy there Argentina, just highlighting it, you know, here just across the rating spectrum, um, and there's a whole different dynamic there. But the 80 to 100 in the US is very different than that in India versus a Brazil, right? And so this is giving you granularity across the rating spectrum. And part of this has to do with exactly what um, we what Roberto highlighted, growth, right? And it is crucial to think about strengthening the growth dynamic. The US as an advanced economy should be growing less. So take them off the table and the breadth and depth of the US economy per capita GDP of over $60,000 provides support for its 100% debt that uh, no one else on this page can, 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 can match. There are other challenges, but at a much higher rating level. But if you look at the growth piece India, right? So yes, it has an extremely sharp contraction this year, but we also have a pretty robust improvement next year. But it's an, the, the growth has historically been high. Trend, the trend growth in China historically been high. The same pattern would be broadly speaking in Asia, and you have a completely different pattern in Brazil. If you look at historically the growth rate over you know, the 2011 to 2018 period, and then you know, last year, low growth. Same story in Argentina of a poor growth story in Mexico, particularly as of late. This puts that debt burden in a different context. That starting point and the prospects to turn around the growth story are really key, okay? That said, what supports Brazil, one of the supports for the rating and the debt dynamics 
is the external piece. Forget about the US, this is complicated here, the very high external debt levels that we have because of its reserve currency status. But Brazil benefits the rating, et cetera, from having very low external debt, huge difference from Argentina, okay? So Argentina's debt ratio, its composition of its debt, non written and, and, and the participation of non-resident besides monetary policy, et cetera, that external piece is a vulnerability that Brazil still has managed to avoid contaminating. That is key for the rating dynamics moving forward, okay? Along with credibility on the monetary policy side. The India benefits from this. So this is another piece why despite that very high debt level, the growth and the high deficits, the growth and the external, but combined lift India's rating vis-a-vis -vis, say a Brazil's rating, which just is quote unquote, is relying in part on this external piece, okay? So I think to highlight, you know, you, you, the very different stories here, and I think it, it highlights the challenges. So besides the growth piece, right? And, and, and this would take time, but I think signals on growth are very important to turn around the fiscal dynamics and the trajectory. The spending composition is key. Um, and I hear I have put up something, you know, the, the pie charts look similar in some sense, but it's basically if Argentina and Brazil have very rigid budgets. If you look at the share of social security in Brazil, 30%, it's higher in, in Argentina at 40%. This is, this is overall, so it includes interest, right? Interest is an, still an important chunk of spending in Brazil, going back to this debt, pro, the, the placing of debt that, that Paolo has been highlighting but payroll at 15%. So if you're thinking about social security, which yes, there's been a pension reform, but that reform is mitigated the growth in social security spending. It hasn't cut social security spending. So if you're talking about almost 50% of spending going to payroll and social security, that weighs on flexibility. The transfers to the states, that's mostly transfer. So that goes to Zana's point as well. So you're left with some, you know, very limited room for maneuver on Brazil's fiscal, fiscal accounts. So that then speaks forward in terms of tackling these challenges of growth and looking within the fiscal accounts are very important. So an administrative reform, a tax reform from the competitive perspective, those are the kind of things that could potentially feed into this fiscal anchor that as, as Zane is highlighting um, in, in terms of moving forward. And that is key for the rating. I think we've taken many rating actions, some up here and also, we've taken many rating actions globally. We've looked at every uh, rating in Latin America, every sovereign rating globally, period, Latin America. Brazil had a positive outlook last December. It lost that positive outlook because we believe the pandemic would be complicating, exacerbating. It's already weak, the weak, two weakness of fiscal and growth. And the question mark about the reform momentum dynamics, which we, thought were a bit brighter in December and then felt that the pandemic dynamics could potentially stall that. So really what's key moving forward for uplift is some of tackling so the, the combination of fiscal and growth. So let me stop here. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. This is, uh, we've, we've had a lot of material uh, to digest. I mean, obviously the situation is, is a tense one, is a complicated one. Everybody uh, acknowledges that there is a great deal of uncertainty um, and we don't really know now how the markets will respond to this. Uh, you know, Brazil is very lucky in the sense that it has a vibrant and, and very active uh, domestic market, a market where the assets can't really leave uh, the government sector, because the government sector is so huge, disproportionately historically and even today. So it has a kind of a captive audience. Uh, but at the same time, um, as, as we've been discussing, it, it has all the makings of an impasse, not to call a crisis. I mean, uh, where the market may at some point really begin to rethink uh, the capacity uh, not of the government to pay, but of the government to short-term roll, roll over its massive debt. debt. And as uh, Marcelo said, uh, going back to 2002, and Roberto also alluded, we've had these episodes in Brazil 
where agents prefer central bank debt to treasury debt, and you get major dislocations uh, in the debt market, uh, simply because uh, the markets uh, prefer uh, to roll over debt over the central bank on a day-to-day -day basis uh, rather than take any treasury risk. And this is basically a, a, a major, major impediment uh, for the functioning of, of financial markets. But anyway, uh, uh, we will hear much more about how the markets are thinking in a little bit. Let's take a very short five-minute break so we can get a cup of water, stretch our feet, uh, and come back and, 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 and listen uh, to what are the crucial assessments, both from the markets and particularly at this point from the political side. I mean, can we really hope uh, that politics uh, will come back uh, in a way that will save the day and, and create a, a, a workable uh, fiscal uh, proposal uh, that will uh, calm uh, and respect the norms. Uh, uh, so let's take a quick break and come back. Thank you. Okay, well, welcome back. Um, as we were discussing just a moment ago, this is uh, beginning to be a tense moment for the markets. Um, we've had a couple of episodes already, but mostly it is the uncertainty. It is this, this, this uh, uncertainty about how much debt will the government uh, need next year. And of course, that is very much linked to the prospect for growth and revenue growth and so much, very much need, uh, linked to how they close the budget if, if they effectively respect uh, the expenditure ceiling. And, and, um, and in addition to this, of course, uh, given the vicissitudes of, of the global situation, uh, the interaction with, with, with the interest rates that have come down so much in Brazil and other global rates, uh, we've also had major bouts of uncertainty on the currency. So uh, a lot to talk about and, and we are delighted uh, uh, to have with us uh, both uh, Dani Tannenbauer Tannen, and uh, José Carlos uh, Carvalho. So let's start with Dani. Dani, could you begin, please? Dani? Yeah, you have to unmute first. You're mute. First one of the day. <laughs> mute. Is this okay now? Now it's fine. Great. Okay, good. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. So first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to, uh, to talk about Brazil. And I think that a good segue to the previous discussion, which was extremely well put in terms of debt dynamics uh, um, and, and, and how uh, the spending path has been taking place uh, over the past few months, um, would like to start from valuation, right? So, so one interesting point or starting point that we have uh, from our perspective, is thinking about currency valuation. Everyone would claim that the Brazilian real here is is quite undervalued. So we actually try to to calculate how big that undervaluation is and put it in perspective. Um, so uh, we have basically three very simple models: uh, purchasing power uh, parity model. We have a real effective exchange rate, uh, productivity based model, and a partial equilibrium model using the current account. Um, the simple average between those models will basically put uh, uh, dollar Brazil at about 27% undervalued, right? Uh, so obviously the, the, the fair value for dollar Brazil is, 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 is a bit below 500 or something like that. Um, the more interesting bit is not really where the fair value is, but historically, when was the last time that we were this cheap, this undervalued, right? And uh, we can only come up with one, inst in one instance since the hell plan started, which is essentially right before uh, the elections, Lula elections back in 2002. Really, uh, and, and here is basically what is the difference between now and then, right? Back then, um, FX reserves were much lower. So obviously the, 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 the debt uh, uh, um, shield that Brazil has today did not exist back then. Um, uh, the fiscal on the other side was in much better shape, right? So those are really the two main contrasts that we have uh, between now and then. 
Um, this is this is both good news and bad news. The good news is that uh, because they have all those effects reserves and they have almost like created this um, sort of non-deliverable forward or, or the, the dollar swap mechanism uh, that allowed Brazil to cushion. On the other side, that's the kind of like the negative side. The, the positive side is it, it has a very deep domestic market. And as a result, it could expand the fiscal, right? So, so the type of fiscal reaction that we saw during the pandemic could not possibly have happened back in 2002, right? Um, so, so it's 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 bad news. It's concerning because the fiscal dynamics are concerning. But on the other side, the fact that Brazil has the the, the mechanics in place today uh, allows it to actually react the way it did to the pandemic, which is which is good news. Now, the second point that I wanted to make is. An undervalued currency tends to, to resolve itself through two paths, right? One is um, appreciation, just nominal appreciation. And the second one is obviously higher inflation. And, and I must say that even though I, I, I believe many on the, this panel will not agree with me, we are going to see higher than expected inflation going forward. And it's, it's almost like crazy to think this way because again, the output gap is something around 10 to 15%. Right, I mean, we do have a very, very wide output gap. We're going to see a higher inflation going forward. This is already happening, right? Um, this is the third point that I wanted to make. If you look at the first focus report, we already have seen an adjustment on inflation expectations for this year um, um, at about 65 uh, um, basis points higher. Uh, we are now at 265 for the end of 2020. Uh, we are at 3%, which is again at the lower end of the, the target range for uh, next year. Uh, but I do believe that inflation expectations for 2021 would start adjusting higher as well. Now, why is that the case? Well, because, because of COVID-19, right? I mean, we are peppered with uh, bottlenecks. Uh, this is not only a story for Brazil, this is a story for the entire world. Uh, those bottlenecks will persist. It's, um, again, you, you cannot go and, and shop the way you did in the past. Uh, you cannot uh, um, transact the way you did in the past. Those bottlenecks will push inflation higher, right? And as a result, as we start recovering, the recovery, one of the main uh, 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 um, uh, stories of this recovery will be higher than expected inflation. This is very well uh, uh, um, documented across uh, the academics, I mean, we've seen papers coming out of Harvard, Brown, Chicago, they're all discussing the fact that inflation will come across higher than expected. So um, keeping that in mind, efficiencies are critical, right? So, so to avoid inflationary outbursts in Brazil, uh, the, the, the improving efficiency and improving productivity are very important. And one of the key themes that we would be following very closely is trade agreements. Which basically brings me to point number four in, in this, right? I mean, the current account in Brazil is only now starting to improve significantly, right? As a result of that same undervalued currency, but a lot of it has to do with uh, um, being uh, ready at the right point at the right time. And essentially Brazil has been developing a very large external surplus against China, right? It's probably one of the largest uh, 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 trade surpluses against China in the world. I mean, you really have a handful of countries that do manage to have that. Um, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, uh, and, and Brazil is probably the only one in the Americas that has such a large uh, trade surplus against China. Uh, it is increasing as well very gradually, and it's something that uh, could should be built on, right? So, so at the moment, actually, with an undervalued currency, uh, the government has a great opportunity to basically tie as many trade agreements as possible. That's the best point to do it, right? You want to actually try to uh, start trade relations with the world when your currency is undervalued. That's really the best point in time. So, uh, so that's probably one of the key themes that we'll be following very, very closely going forward. Um, um, on top of that, we are starting to see inflows into equities in Brazil. It also ties uh, really nicely with the, the discussion that we had from the NDS earlier today. The fact that the NDS is looking to unwind their equity portfolio makes a lot of sense right now, because if indeed the environment will be one where there is more uh, uh, pricing power 
on, on the company's level, right? That's a great point to start uh, unfolding or unwinding uh, your equity portfolio. People want to buy equities in a higher inflationary environment. Um, so again, unwinding equity portfolio at BNBS, super positive. Trade agreements, super positive that could counterbalance that same high inflationary outlook that we have on the other side of this, right? Um, on the other on the other end, um, we are still concerned about duration exposure in Brazil. Uh, we do believe that the back end is very well priced when it comes to issuance. Again, this is something that came up in the discussions before. Where, um, there is a lot of rollover over the past, over the next twelve months. Um, um, the curve is steep enough to price that. Right. And we do believe that actually buying long duration in Brazil and hedging the effects is probably uh, uh, the better trade to have on. That's uh, literally the, the bias that we would have at the moment. It's not only a story for Brazil. You have that happening in South Africa. You have that happening in India. Even in China, buying bonds and hedging the effects is attractive. But Brazil is particularly attractive because you have such a wide spread between the bond yield in the back end and uh, uh, the, the FX hedge that you would have. On top of that, you also have the highest real yield in the world in the back end. So if you want to just have a pure inflation story, uh, buying the NTNBs and hedging the FX also uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, just, a, you know, I wanted to close with, with this point, and this is more of, of, of an introduction of a solution and summarizing everything that I talked about. Um, higher inflation might be a good thing for Brazil, right? Um, not only because uh, you would see that bias towards buying equities, but also because the government has transformed the way they are indexing the minimum wages, public sector wages, and the social security, right? Everything in Brazil is indexed to the minimum wage, right? If you indeed start adjusting the minimum wages by inflation minus a factor, that in itself would be a very important balancing act to the fiscal, right? Critical, right? I mean, again, keep in mind that uh, social security payments alone is 50% of, uh, of the spending ceiling, right? Public sector wages alone are 20% of the spending ceiling. Between those two items, we're talking 70% of the spending ceiling, that if indeed you have higher inflation, you could start clearing a part of that through inflation. This is, this is very, very likely to trigger protests. This is very likely to, to trigger um, a lot of complaints. So obviously the key concern here would be political stability. Um, the, that's a, something that we should keep in mind, but it's, um, it's not a problem in my opinion, it's a part of the solution. Right. So I'll stop here uh, with that question mark. Uh, so overall, my bias is somewhat positive, cautiously positive, but obviously I understand what the problems are. And I do believe there is room for dollar Brazil to go higher. Thank you, Danny. Uh, this is excellent. I mean, I'm, I'm glad you're positive. I mean, <laughs> thinking that we are going to get higher inflation and that the solution is to reduce the real level of the of the minimum wage, which uh, I don't know. I would like to hear what the opinions are of the other panelists on the second round, and whether indeed that that is um, the easiest way to to deal with things. But you're right. I think that in the sense, uh, you know, obviously this is time uh, uh, for some uh, fiscal solutions that are more durable and in a different uh, macro environment. But I would like to turn to Jose Carlos and, and see how he is viewing the same challenges uh, from his perspective. Jose Carlos, thank you very much. And please go ahead. I think you have to unmute yourself. Second, there. second. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Paulo. Thank you for the chamber, for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to, to be here with you and, and, and exchange ideas with, with such a, a great team here. Uh, I, I would. Uh, say uh, that I, I'm more in line with, with Daniel, uh, I would say I'm a little bit uncautiously optimistic. Uh, <laughs> <at this point. laughs> uh, first, you know, to start, I think it's very important that we, we distinguish, uh, although it's at the same rate, you know, but the interest rate has two, two roles here uh, in the economy. One is the interest rate that sets uh, uh, the inflation target, you know, so 
we we had a friend, Paulo. You were a, a under go, a vice governor of Central Bank, and one of your colleagues used to say that the role at the central bank is very easy. You only have one goal and one instrument. The goal <laughs> is the CDIC rate and, and there's the target. So if it's out, out of the target, you hike rates, if it's lower, you lower rates, so it's very easy. So uh, when you look at, uh, as people said before here in this panel, if you look at, at the forecast for this year, next year, 2023, 24, inflation is on target. So uh, the CELIC is at the place where it should be. So in terms of the central bank, that's the right place. You know? Uh, the, the, the one thing very different uh, right now this year is that the Treasury has uh, unprecedented, you know, because of the reasons why Lisa said the whole world has the same problem, uh, has a gigantic uh, primary deficit, 11% of GDP. So I, I sit in the trading desk and, and I see the anxiety of the traders every Thursday when the, the, the auction of the Treasury comes out. Uh, it's a lot of money and you have to finance a lot of money. So the needs are approximately 120 billion reais in October, November, and December. One, one, 120 is one and a half percent of GDP. Uh, uh, so this, uh, in principle, then Chris is going to be able to talk a little bit about that. We'll come to an end as, as we, we move to 2021. The budget for next year it assumes a 3% for the whole year of primary uh, uh, deficit. Uh, and uh, I've been discussing this with Chris, and, and he can correct me when, when he, he speaks. I believe the budget we're going to be uh, uh, will be will be complying with, with the spending cap. Why is that? It's a little bit not because Bolsonaro wants it. You know, I'm pretty sure Bolsonaro wants to to go over the cap. I'm pretty sure uh, Vice President Moro wants to go over the cap. Rogério Marinho, and whoever. Uh, but my view. Uh, is that the way to do it? You no, know, the only way to do it is to 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 go through a, a constitutional amendment, uh, and uh, and there is a very big political group that is trying to uh, align themselves in a in a center candidacy for the presidency two years down the road. That is Rodrigo Maia, uh, Doria, Eduardo Leite from Rio Grande do Sul, uh, uh, Flavio Dino, if there's no lot of left sort of a leftist there, Paulo Artungi, Arminio Fraga's economist, Percio Arida. This group, they, they are pretty scared uh, that Bolsonaro is so well in the polls uh, with a 15 to 20% unemployment rate. So uh, their mindset is, uh, uh, if, if he's doing so well right now, uh, 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 at this point, if you give him a, a Bolsa Cidadana, a citizenship uh, 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 grants, uh, this guy is going to win the election very easily. So since there is a constitutional amendment needed, I think this group will block any change. They will not say it uh, the way I'm exposing uh, because it's very unpopular. So the way they say, like Rodrigo Mai says, no, I'm very committed to the, to the cap. I'm going to make sure that the cap is going to be fulfilled. But what's behind is not to give this grant to Bolsonaro because it will make his life very easy for re-election. So I think it's very difficult. And, and any arrangement in extending the emergency budget, you know, many people have pointed out, first, it's not a long-term solution. You're going to keep spending it all the time. Second, Bolsonaro is very proud that, you know, COVID is doing fine in Brazil. Uh, the deaths are going down. So why, why are you going to extend the, the expenditures? And Rodrigo Maia said, we'll not put it through. Uh, uh, the TCU, the, the, the accounting court today said they're against it and, and, and Supreme Court might also be against it. So I, I don't see a way through. I think we're going to be complying with it, but not because Bolsonaro wanted, wants, but because it's, it's, uh, it, it's going to be the hard thing to do. Uh, I don't think uh, that the steepness of the curve represents uh, a reading of the Brazil risk. I, I think it's more uh, a saturation of the market with so many supply of, of paper. Uh, that's what I see. Uh, if you want to see a, a Brazilian market of bonds that uh, is not saturated, is it external bonds? CDS are trading hovering around 200 basis points. So that's very uh, reasonable. And if anyone thinks oh, there's a risk of default, you could you know, buy CDS at 2% per year. That's a very cheap hedge. If you, if you, uh, you, you probably don't think that Brazil will 
uh, default local bonds and pay foreigners. So uh, they're going to be defaulted to. So I don't think it's that's that's the issue. The issue is the excess supply of papers, and and I think this will reduce significantly when we start 2021. Uh, I see also I'm a, a little bit more optimistic on, on the growth side. Uh, we have been revising up, you know, the the, the growth. Uh, uh, in the consensus in Brazil, looking at Bloomberg, it was six and a half down by the middle of the year. Now it's about minus five percent. Our estimate here is around minus four, but that's that's the the, the consensus, the, the, the aggregation for 2021. The latest number uh, year over year of EBCBR that came out in August is already minus four percent, and there is a very good correlation. This is still August. There is a very good correlation with the consumption of electricity in Brazil. And consumption of electricity, we have it on a daily basis. So if you look, uh, the the number for October 15 is zero year over year zero in electricity consumption. That's a very big correlation with uh, IBCBR, which is a monthly GDP number for Brazil. For those who who, are, who don't follow very closely, so I think uh, we have been revising up uh, the numbers. Roberto, in the beginning, he, he said uh, he just moved from minus five and something to four percent, and and we did the same, and I think we're going to keep revising this as if these uh, electricity numbers are correct, and I think they are, they usually are. We're going to have a, a more positive number. Probably GDP uh, uh, will be minus four or minus three and a half this year, but December uh, 20, against December 19, probably we're going to have slightly positive numbers. So I think that that's going to be also nice for. Uh, for uh, growing out of the problem, that that should be also uh, a good good point. Uh, uh, one sh one evidence I think it's very interesting to see uh, how there's a lot of things going on in Brazil behind you know the clouds of, of COVID is the number of uh, the operations in capital markets. We look at the number of IPOs and follow-ons in Brazil. Uh, a first record was in, in 2007 and under Lula, 170 operations. Last year, we had a record of 200 operations. And this year, from January to September, we have 198 already. And a lot of IPOs and follow-ons coming through. So we're going to have a record number of operations in capital markets this year, which I think bodes well for investment next year and, and, and uh, uh, increase uh, in, in growth. Uh, also, uh, I think uh, Brazil might might have uh, uh, a little uh, extra effect here from interest rates. You know, we have negative interest rates in real terms right now, something we haven't had for ever in Brazil since the beginning of the health plan. Uh, and the way I think that this will play out, you know, we're going to have a, a significant wealth effect going on. Just uh, Thinking about nominal GDP next year, nominal GDP probably is going to be around 4% real growth plus 3% inflation, about around 7% nominal GDP. And uh, interest rates right now are at 2%. Probably they're going to go up uh, at some point, but maybe to 3%, you know. Uh, uh, and, and we're going to have, a, we have never had that before, you know. Uh, nominal GDP is so uh, above uh, uh, basic rate as we have had in the past. That's that's one of the reasons why why I think the capital market is so uh, uh, so bullish right right now. And just to to come to a conclusion here, I agree also with Daniel when he said about the real. Uh, and we did a, a first. No, there is evidence that we might be around a, a turnaround in the real there. Uh, as Daniel said, the last five months we had had a, a current account surplus. Uh, we are moving the 12 month accumulated to a surplus also uh, pretty soon. Uh, and also we did a study comparing uh, uh, overshooting episodes. So we look in the last 30 years, we found 82 uh, overshooting episodes. Then uh, since Brazil has, is going to have a very low inflation two years after the overshooting, so probably 3% this year, 3% next year, 6% two years after the overshooting. We got out of these 82 cases, uh, those who had a CPI below 10% two years after the overshooting. And in those cases, we see that usually 
uh, the adjustment of the real exchange rate is through a, a nominal appreciation. So like Argentina, the exchange goes and inflation goes. Exchange go, inflation goes. In Brazil, since we had very low inflation, probably went, and what happened in those 24 cases out of these 82, uh, is that we had a, a nominal appreciation of around 20% uh, in the second year after the peak. Probably the peak in Brazil is gonna be around the end of the year. Usually at the end of the year, uh, there are outflows uh, of corporations. And this year we have this uh, overhead of the bank story. The central bank just released uh, the stability report and they finally put a number to the overhead of the bank. So uh, the total overhead of the banks is $30 billion. Uh, and they're gonna cancel half of it uh, by December. So banks are gonna be buying futures, not sending money abroad. They're gonna be buying futures in BMF about five, $15 billion in December. So probably the peak of the real is gonna be around there. We're gonna have further improvements in the current account by then. And uh, I think we're gonna see a reversal in, in the health towards appreciation by next year, uh, which also should be good for the mood of the market. So I'm, I'm a little bit more constructive there in understanding the challenges. And, and I think you know, great part of the, the, the deficiencies we had this year has to do with you know, this accommodating this huge primary deficit. But I think things will gonna move uh, either in lower deaths next year and also in better growth next year, I think the market is going to feel better. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jose Carlos. It's, it's comforting to hear this view, and, and, and let's hope that um, it turns out. We'll, we'll, we'll have a, a round of discussions just following all of this, and I think I have a couple of questions that we might uh, want to explore. But obviously, what you said hinges directly on, on, on the political developments. I mean, if I understand you correctly, uh, basically, there is a large share of, 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 of the Congress that's willing to let aggregate demand plummet because without any kind of support, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, or maybe there is a recovery that is endogenous, but if it's not, uh, you know, without any kind of support, you, you certainly will have a shock to aggregate demand, uh, but that, that's, that's okay because it's in consonance with their political objectives, which is, it's a, it's, it is a, I, I, I buy that story. I think it's an interesting story that, that really, I mean, it, it, the only way that Bolsonaro seems to have gained popularity was by copying what Lula did and giving money out. Uh, in, in this way, in this case, uh, in, a, in a much better way, but it still was that. So, so it all turns back to the politics and we are very fortunate to have Chris Garman with us to help us uh, through all of this many layers of discussion. So Chris, please go ahead. Thank you, Paulo. Uh, and thank you for the invitation to participate in this uh, conversation. It's always a, a great pleasure uh, to have these kind of uh, you know um, talks with such uh, such notable colleagues uh, and high profile um, kind of a conversation here uh, with um, you know the, the comments not only in the previous panel uh, but also as well um, you know which was, was which was just said um, I would begin by saying that I uh, that I fit myself <laughs> within the category uh, of the of the say the cautious optimism uh, bucket uh, of Jose Carlos and also of, of the, uh, you know looking at what I'm seeing um, on the political front uh, and let me kind of justify that initial assertion first talking about what do I see the politics on the big fiscal debate of the day and then also talk about you know the politics of the reform agenda that can potentially increase you know, uh, the productivity um, of Brazil's economy and speak to the growth kind of story, right? Um, and I would say that the headlines look worse than what I'm seeing on the ground on both fronts, right? So on the, on the fiscal debate, you know, um, you know, in terms of you know, what, what do I see kind of guiding, let's say, the incentive structures of political actors in Brasilia? And I, here I talk about party leaders in Congress, I talk about President Bolsonaro, and other ministers. And, uh, and I, I would make the case that they're really kind of two big, you know, let's say objectives or structures of incentives that are 
guiding the behavior of these key actors um, that are a bit in conflict with each other, right? But we just have to understand them. And, and I think the first one is a constructive one. I, you know, I, I, I take Jose Carlos's point that there is a group in Congress that doesn't want to give Bolsonaro a blank check to go out and spend for 2022. And that is kind of the party leadership of some of these centrist parties or the opposition that are looking at the 22 to presidential election. But I would argue that there's a larger constraint um, that's in the backdrop of all of these actors, which is, I think that we have a political class in Brazil uh, that was partially shaped by the previous economic and political crisis of 2015-16. You know, let's not forget, we went through an acute economic crisis, a contraction of 7% of GDP, it led to the downfall of President Dilma Rousseff. Uh, since that, that, that break and that traumatic moment, we've had four years of debate on fiscal policy in which the economic team repeatedly went to Congress. They, they laid out the fiscal imbalances. They made the case that the fiscal imbalances were the Achilles heel of the Brazil's economy. They, they had numerous meetings with party leaders in Congress that led to the approval of the cap on spending in 2016, failed attempt for pension reform in 2017, election, successful attempt of pension reform in 2019. And I noticed the difference. I noticed the difference that when I speak to the senators and party leaders in the lower house, that at least there is a stronger connection today between fiscal imbalances on the one hand and an economic crisis where everybody loses on the other. That link is not as, as strong as everyone in this Zoom call, but it, 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 and there are shades of gray, but at least there is a fear um, in the political class that if they get the fiscal wrong, we're all in trouble. And I think that that fear is shared by the president. This is a very important point. There is a view out there that, while well, his approval rating shot up because he's spending money on the auxiliary benefit. And therefore his conclusion is that I got to continue to spending to be able to get to 2022. I disagree with that uh, assessment of the president. I think the president is afraid of a scenario of an unanchored kind of fiscal expectations that will undermine the conditions for an economic recovery in 2021, 2022, and therefore his reelection prospects uh, in two years from now. That's exactly what Central Bank President Roberto Campos Neto is telling the president privately. That's exactly what Minister of Economy Paulo Guedes is telling the president. It is translated in the defense of the spending cap. And everyone, I think, has that, that, uh, that fear. Now, the, the, the caveat is, well, everyone's trying to figure out what is the limit of fiscal responsibility, right? So the economic team says it is fully respecting the spending cap as of January 1 next year. Then other ministers say, oh, say, well, we spent 600 billion reais this year an extraordinary fashion, what's an extra 30 or 50 next year? Are you telling me that's gonna break the bank, right? And, and so the point is, is that, that in the process of the actors recognizing what are the limits of fiscal responsibilities, the market plays a very important role. And I think the last two or three weeks was critical. We had the administration coming out with a proposal to limit spending on precatorios, directing money from Fundebi. Uh, the reaction was horrible from an asset price point of view. Pundits came to the press, said this was a fiscal accounting trick uh, akin to what Jim Rousseff did. You know, you had a, 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 a series of, of contestations in the, in the press more broadly, and the presidential palace got spooked. Party leaders in Congress got spooked. The party, the government's leadership said, no, no, we're not gonna back down. You know, it's not a two or 3% you know, sell off in asset prices is gonna change my mind. But I've been, but in speaking with party leaders and senators, what they told me is that they were getting, you know, calls from the productive sector of the economy. You know, there's, big businesses were getting worried about a crisis of confidence, right? And, and that hit Congress. And so the proposal to limit payments on pecatorias was discarded. And the negotiations for a more ambitious version of a fiscal reform came back on the table. Minister uh, Paulo Gadges, um, re, you know, gained the protagonism of these negotiations in the context where he was weakened previously. It scared the, the, the lower house speaker, Rodrigo Maia, it led to a reconciliation of Rodrigo Maia and Paulo Guedes to be able to start working together. Right? In other words, the political class's reaction function to the sell-off, it was constructive. And it ultimately it shows that that kind of fear of the fiscal anchor being undermined is coming back as these market constraints are also rearing. Now, key then is how do you reconcile that on the one hand with also a political pressure to be able to attend to acute social needs coming from a pandemic, which isn't over, right? And, 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 and this whole very noisy process is how do you reconcile the two? How do you thread the needle between the two, right? And so what I expect is that this is gonna be a process 
in which the president is very explicit over how divided he is. He really is stuck between a rock and a hard place. It's not that he just wants to spend, right? And so, you know, what, what, what I see this occurring is that after the municipal elections, you're going to have a draft bill you know, presented by Senator Maus, uh, Mauricio Bittar. It's going to include elements of a fiscal reform, anticipating the triggers to the spending cap, which essentially freezes, you know, public sector uh, payroll increases and prohibits increase of the minimum wage above inflation if you reach a certain threshold of spending, not only next year, but of the subsequent years, right? It includes a provision to lower uh, compensation to higher income uh, public sector servants, um, you know, up to 25% by reducing the work hours. It includes a cap on, on super salaries. Is that enough to stabilize the cap over time? Probably not, right? I mean, you're, you're gonna have to take various bites at the apple, you know, but at least the point is, is that the spending cap, I think, is playing its role. It is, it is, it is making clear the difficult trade-offs for fiscal responsibilities, and it is moving the political debate forward. We're probably going to be in equilibrium where you're going to be approving these measures at the edge of the precipice, right? So from the market point of view, we may not have clarity over what can be approved, but I do think that some version of a fiscal reform will probably get approved in January in an extraordinary session of Congress, uh, precisely to be able to to, to fund some version of a social welfare program that is funded by cuts in spending elsewhere. Uh, if you do that and you take a step forward on this fiscal reform, I do believe that there could be room for some extraordinary spending above the cap tied to the pandemic that is not permanent spending and it is restricted in time and restricted in scope because you know the pandemic isn't over as well, right? And I think that, you know, Jose Carlos is correct that the legal ways to do so are very controversial. If you use extraordinary credits, you have to have a justification that's unforeseen expenses. How can you justify that? Uh, if you extend the public calamity decree, you know, you don't want to do a, a, a simple extension with the same level of spend. It has to be very, very restricted amount of spending. So I think some, some version of extra cap spending will come, but if it's accompanied with the fiscal reform and is not funding a permanent expense, I think that from a market point of view, potentially, you can have room for a little bit of wiggle room in the very short term. But you, the key is, is that you're signaling the political class willing to take steps forward on, on the fiscal reforms. And when I speak with party leaders in the lower house and the Senate, I do think that there are conditions to approve some of these elements of the fiscal reform, particularly anticipating the triggers to the spending cap, and particularly jornada de trabalho, which is furlough, um, or something on the payroll side, I think can get done. So I'm a little bit more constructive on the politics. And I would say that I'm more encouraged on the politics today precisely because Bolsonaro's approval ratings are higher, right? I think it's a good thing that he doesn't have to worry about impeachment hanging over his head and trying to be able to walk the balance between fiscal responsibility on the one hand and how to be able to attend social needs of the pandemic on the other. And he doesn't have to worry about, you know, an impeachment risk uh, for his, his vote in the plenary of the lower house. Uh, it gives him more leverage. It means that the centrist parties have less uh, room for to, to hold the president hostage. It makes him more risk tolerant uh, because because he has actually he has room to he can have a little bit of a drop in the before ratings next year as long as the economy recovers. He's still in a good position in 2022, right? And so, and when I speak with party leaders, they tell me that the environment for approving a reform like that has improved. So what's really interesting is that markets have sold off. On, a, on all this noisy process of decision making, which is dysfunctional within the administration, yes. Um, but the underlying political conditions to broker some version of a bargain, I think, have improved over the past couple of months. So I, I, I think that you're going to be at knife's edge. You may have other scary moments in the market in the next couple of months, but I do think that some version of a fiscal reform gets done uh, probably by, by January in an extraordinary session of Congress, point number one. Point number two, real quick, I know that I'm getting over my uh, close to my limit here is. I do not think that the conditions, I, don't, I do not think that the reform agenda on the productivity reforms, right? Reforms that increase the productivity of the economy uh, are also stalled or dead in the water. Um, you know, when we look at, I think the mother of all these reforms to keep an eye on is tax reform. Um, yes, there's been a lot of confusion over the tax reform, particularly the economic team's proposal to lower the payroll tax. But what we're hearing from the members of the, of the mixed committee, uh, a joint committee of the Senate and the lower house uh, evaluating tax reform in Congress is that there still is support to have a proposal to unify federal, state, and local VAT taxes. It has unparalleled support of governors. Rodrigo Maya wants to bring this to a vote before he, he, uh, he steps down as, as speaker. Um, if you don't get a vote in the lower house before he steps down, 
You'll have to look at who's going to succeed them in the lower house. But the lower house leadership are looking to move on tax reform next year. Okay? I think it's, uh, you know, I still think that there are conditions to, to move this forward. You look at some of the microeconomic regulatory reforms. We approved and overhauled the sanitation uh, sector about two months ago. This week, the Senate is talking about approving legislation for central bank autonomy and a new regulatory framework for gas distribution. Uh, there is on the pipeline, you know, conditions to approve, you know, move on, on, on a bankruptcy legislation, a new regulatory framework for rail infrastructure, uh, PPPs. You know, obviously these are all secondary to the big fiscal debate and probably not as important as the tax. But what was really interesting about this Congress um, that we saw previously is that a lot of these leaders are looking at these reforms as being in their individual political self-interest. It was kind of a reformist Congress that wasn't predicated on the president having an overarching coalition. That element is still there, right? Obviously in the middle of a pandemic, they're all focused on short-term needs and there are a lot of risks associated with that. I absolutely see that, but I, I, I think it'll be a mistake to conclude that this productivity reform agenda uh, has come to an end. Final comment um, is, you know, I, I'm kind of giving you, let's say, the, the moderate um, optimistic or at least a cautiously optimistic view. But, you know, I, I am fully cognizant, and I think we all need to be fully cognizant, that if the political conditions right now look better than they did at the heart of the COVID, you know, we surely should expect that 2021 will be a more difficult political year than 2020. Incumbents have all gotten a pass during COVID-19, either because they have support for the extraordinary measures of a lockdown, or they have very ambitious fiscal stimulus relief packages. That's not going to be the case next year. So I think next year, we will feel the social and economic pains of this pandemic. I expect the president's support ratings to decline gradually over the first half of next year, because you're going to have a significant retraction of, uh, of, of relief no matter what. He will pay a price for it. It's not going to be a dramatic drop because these families will still be grateful for the president to having given this benefit in a period of crisis. But you will, you know, have a drop and politics will get nastier over time. So I do think that while you still have progress on some of these reforms, I have no doubts that over the course of next year, you may have, let's say, populist proposals on a microeconomic basis popping up in Congress to provide relief to consumers or other businesses. And how do you reconcile that with fiscal responsibility will be a constant noise over the course of 2021. So it is a challenging year, but at least I think that the, the collective fear of going off the fiscal edge of the cliff is large enough that will lead to incremental solutions to buy yourself time. And so I think that this, you know, we're in for a multi-stage fiscal reform agenda, not only one right now, but one another potentially before the presidential elections, and the next president will have to do another deeper round. The delinking of inflation to, uh, to social benefits and the minimum wage, uh, for, for, for Dunny's kind of point here, um, I think that's only possible in the next mandate. I don't think that that's possible pol politically to even talk about that kind of uh, delinking of, uh, of these adjustment benefits over the next two years. But maybe the fiscal environment will deteriorate so much and the market pressure will grow so much that you generate the political conditions to do it in the next administration. Let me end here. I probably Thank went you. Minutes over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. This was uh, excellent. And um, I'm glad you have this constructive view. Uh, it seems to me, and now, and now I will go back um, and, and give the floor back to starting with Roberto and then Marcelo and so on for very quick interventions and responses, please, about, you know, as quick as you can be. But I, I am really, really curious to see uh, what the responses are, because if I understand the debate so far, what we have is some sort of a disconnect. I mean, in, on the one hand, uh, people seem to think that the economy is doing so reasonably okay already that, uh, that if you don't need any exceptional measures next year, things will be okay. So, so the idea that you will have a shock to aggregate demand if nothing else comes in and that, that some of this recovery uh, will begin to falter, that unemployment is still an exceptionally high, um, is, 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 is not an issue that somehow you could, you, you don't have to, to deal with this, you could deal with the day to day as you progress, as, as Chris said, perhaps with some pointed initiatives that are really just uh, 
you know, are not not for real, are, are, are just placebos. Or on the other hand, you, you do have an economy that, that begins to falter because it doesn't have any more additional support. And then that creates its own dynamics in terms of what happens to the revenues and the fiscal and so on. So I'm, I, I would like to go back and ask first Roberto if you could comment on what you heard. And in particular, what, what is your expectation about growth and the underlying growth rate that, that when we can see over, over the coming months? Um, thank you, Paulo. Um, just starting with your last question in terms of growth, we have 3.5 for next year, but to a large extent, this is the result of the, 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 the fast rebound in the second half of this year, leaving a very high carryover effect yeah. for next year. So I have 3.5 and 2022, we have 1.8. So basically going back to that area between one to 1 1.5%, that is, is not great. Although um, Jose Carlos made a, a very valid point that in, in the short term, the fact that nominal GDP growth hopefully will stay above, like starting next year above uh, interest rates that, that, that could be helpful in terms of the, the the fiscal dynamics in the very short term, provided we don't lose the fiscal anchor. So that window of opportunity of lower uh, rates, uh, which uh, Marcelo also alluded to, because from, from the central bank's point of view, like we, we, we don't see significant pressures there can be helpful, but I do have concerns about the potential, like how the transition would happen from December 31st to January 1st, if we have a blackout in terms of the the, the emergency benefit. Um, I, don't, I don't know what the easy solution here is. I think it's very hard to see. It's not impossible, but it's hard to see a scenario where Brasilia just decides to do nothing, just, just let it expire on December 31st and go back to the Bolsa Familia with the very same size that it has now. Um, so some resources will have to be found. I agree with Zena that we're focusing only on the issue of the welfare benefit, but there are a bunch of other leakages happening too that will have to be addressed, be it the difference between the INPC for minimum wage and the, the fact that the ceiling grew less with the IPCA, the extension of the of the, 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 the payroll tax break that could cost five to 10 billion next year that is not budgeted either. So just if, even if we forget for a moment the, the, the welfare benefit, what might happen or not, we have 10 to 15 billion reais already uh, uh, in need to be found between these other, uh, uh, other items. I'm not going to get into all the details of there, but uh, the, the budget is certainly tight. Um, ideally, there will be enough of uh, coordination, which seems a tall ask only in four weeks in December to have a plan in place by December 31st to allow a smooth transition because we do think that uh, economic activity will feel a little bit of a setback the first quarter of next year because those incredible numbers that I uh, mentioned in the beginning of my presentation on, on retail sales will not uh, continue. Uh, that that right. will not be possible. And, and as you mentioned, unemployment, we expect it to continue to uh, inch higher. Uh, many of the, the companies that have put uh, their employees uh, on, on, on furlough or like these new programs that the government has created, this, we don't really know how that's going to pan out. And at the very least, as you mentioned, like if it weren't for the contraction in the um, participation rate, like unemployment would be much higher. So it's, um, it's, uh, it's good to hear that the, the, those who look more closely into the market are, are more optimistic than, 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 than economists and analysts here. But uh, That's not uh, unusual. Yeah, no, I know. And, and I hope they're right. Um, but it's just that there are too many questions along the way that to the point that Chris raised, uh, um, the, the, the headline risks will remain high no matter what, I think. Uh, hopefully, the, the responses of market will guide the responses of government in terms of like the, the, it, helping them in assess the risks entailed with whatever ideas come along the way. But I don't see an easy solution to that. The, the, the best one would be to basically go back to Bolsa Familia and increase it as possible with uh, uh, cutbacks in the budget. But that would demand time. And I don't know 
um, if, 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 if the political um, the, the political reasoning is is aligned with um, uh, the one that um, uh, Jose Carlos mentioned before. Thank you, thank thank you, Roberto. Marcelo, are, are you there? Would you would you like to comment on this? I mean, uh, you've looked in great detail at uh, what potential GDP could be and 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 yeah. where we are on this growth cycle. Could you give us a, a little bit of comment? Yes, uh, short remarks only. I forgot to, to say that um, my measure of the equilibrium rate was between one, one and three percent, depending on the methodology. About the potential growth, I'm a bit more optimistic. I think it's between one and two percent, maybe closer to one with all this mess this year, productive may have the hint. Uh, in terms of a, a GDP gap, output gap, I'm not that pessimist. I think it's uh, around uh, seven percent negative because I take a, a, a weight average between the situation unemployment and situation in capacity utilization in industry. Kind of mid, mid, it makes a, a bit the the IPA number. I'm, I think the IPA is is a little bit pessimist. So in, in regards to inflation and, and next year. I think there is a lot of inertia on service inflation. So service inflation is uh, down and we won't accelerate that much. And the, the, the shock in, 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 tem in foods uh, are temporary. So maybe the fa phase out next year. And um, in terms of, uh, of uh, FX, I think it's undervalued uh, about even or over 30%. So uh, I think it's really undervalued. And this point that uh, I think it was Daniel said that, um, or uh, who look at 80 cases of um, when there is a devaluation and no inflation in the next two years, the the the, the, pre, the the most common result is an appreciation of nominal rate. It kind of makes a lot of sense. And the last thing I think the uh, comments what Garman said, Chris said, I think Congress is afraid to push Brazil down the cliff. And, and that's it. So you agree with that? Yes. Good. That's good. Thank you, Marcel. On, on that note, uh, Zena, are you as constructive on the ability of, of us maneuvering through all of these fiscal burdens? Well, um, so th th thank you, Paulo. A few comments here. I think that this, despite the improvement in terms of uh, the print for GDP, for next year, I think the overall sentiment will not be better than this year, actually, considering uh, comparing to the second half. Um, so I, I see, I do see risks to the upside for inflation. I agree with Danielle, but if that would, uh, well, I'm not discussing here the level, but I, I see risks, growing risks, um, and I, th I think this adds to you know to this uh, environment of uncertainty. So I don't believe that the sentiment in the market will be so bullish, uh, as Jose Carlos mentioned. Uh, I see um, very low appetite for foreign direct investments in Brazil um, for several reasons. But, but I think that the, the volatility in the FX market will continue. And in it's per se is, uh, you know, it's uh, something really negative for, for investing in Brazil, for this appetite for investing in Brazil, aside from environmental issues and regulatory issues that we know. Um, regarding uh, the uh, uh, relation between markets and, and, uh, and the Congress, I do see that uh, there is concern uh, regarding market reactions, but this tells us that we could have two equilibrium here. If markets are complacent, we're not going to have any reform at all. And risks of setbacks, in my opinion, are increasing, as I mentioned in the, in the first panel, the panel, uh, previous panel. Um, so uh, on the other hand, basically what Chris is saying is that things need to get worse before they improve in order to have reforms. That's the point. Because, OK, there is some pragmatism, yeah, indeed. But there is no structured plan the, the economy minister is, you know, they don't have a structure plan. And, and I 
don't see uh, Paulo Guedes, unfortunately, convincing the president about the importance of structural reforms. So I, I think they are just kicking the can. Just let, let's see what happens after elections. I, I think they are just trying to gain some time to make markets understand that, you know, some flexibility in the rules are needed. And something that I, I think is important, economies are divided. There are several economies defending flexibilization of the spending cap, several of them. And it impacts the, the Congress. So I think, I, I think the sentiment next year will not be so bullish. Okay. Thank you, Zaina. Lisa, any, any comments on your side? I mean, you know, you, you particularly this, this I, I like you to comment on this idea. I mean, I, I thought Marcelo was spot on, on, on when looking at the that given the size of the domestic debt, what you should be looking at is some other measure of, 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 of you know, where the, so where the risk, sovereign risk is. But anyway, I mean, that's just a detail. What's the broader questions? So when we're looking at debt, we're looking at the entire picture. So we're starting and, and we work up to the foreign currency rating. I think that's an important point to highlight. We no longer give any uplift for Brazil's local currency rating despite the depth of its capital markets because of the order of magnitude of its debt in essence. Okay. Mm -hmm. it, years ago, there were actually two notches. Our criteria is now limited to one notch, but there's no notches because of the weight of the size of the domestic debt, notwithstanding an independent monetary policy, certainly um, you know, in terms of execution, even though they're not formal and the floating exchange rate regime. So just to put that out there. Um, and, and I think the comment that the, the notion that the domestic debt market is, is somewhat captive, right? And so that plays a role. Um, but, you know, moving beyond the, those fiscal pieces, which we talked about a whole lot, I think I wanted to pick up and kind of we're all talking about, you know, what the growth might be next year. But then Marcelo made the point, he still has just 1% growth for potential, right? When we're stepping back, it's trend growth. It's not just one year's worth of growth that is more of the problem for Brazil. So it's a, it's a track record of low investment, low productivity. And so exactly the points that Danny highlighted, trade, right? If you can talk about trade opening, but then, then my, Jose Carlos, you highlighted I think the IPO, which that's a dynamic. You know, if you can get efficiency gains in terms of investment, it's in some ways there. These are the kind of things to continue to expand a reform agenda bit by bit the Custo Brazil piece, the BC hashtag. So those have been on the, 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 the Bolsonaro agenda, of course, sidelined by the pandemic. But if you can get back on that there, turn that around, that's key because we're talking not just one year's worth of growth, but trend growth and how to tackle that. I think, and then Chris highlights, you know, kind of the piecemeal approach. That is what you've seen in Brazil, right? You've never had one big bang reform. And I remember at the head of the social, when social security under the Bolsonaro administration was moving ahead, it's like, is this it? Is this gonna then turn everything around on the fiscal side? And I was like, it's one piece of, the, of a complex fiscal picture and to be a, an overall solution. And you're gonna have iterations. And I think that that's Brazil on iteration. And if you can, I think what would be important for the market is if you just, you can see continued progress on the iterations versus a slippage. I think that's that's a key a key piece from from the from the market and certainly from the rating perspective. Thanks. Uh, Paolo, we have a couple of questions from. The thank you, thank you. I'm sorry, there is a phone ringing here, but don't pay attention to it. Danny, let's go to your to your uh, reactions, please. I'll close my mute. I'll mute me. Okay, so. Danny, are you there? Your sound is very bad. Maybe I go first, Paul, then, then here. Please, Jose Carlos, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 Jose Carlos, uh, 
Go on. Could you please I mean, mute Danny and, and let Jose Carlos speak first? John. Okay. Uh, Thank you. But it's, I think we have been discussing here a lot of very, very difficult uh, variables, you know, and, and uh, you know, I, I like to conclude here, you know, thinking a little bit, a little bit more on the longer term. Uh, and, and I always remind me the, the Churchill quote say about the U.S. saying that the U.S. ends up doing the right thing after trying all the other alternatives. And I think Brazil, uh, we kind of enter in a similar path uh, recently, you know. Uh, so I, I like to think, you know, when I have to decide about very complex things like we, we have been discussing here to make a uh, hypothesis, you know, and, and my hypothesis is that in every turn that Brazil has had in the past few years, we have, we took the right uh, turn. For example, Dilma was overspending. People are saying, oh, we're not going to be able to, to impeach her. You know, it's very, very difficult. She has a lot of power and Brazil impeached Dilma. Then people said, Temer will not govern, we're gonna be a weak president. You know, Temer went there, he did the, the labor reform, which was very important. He did the, the, the spending cap, which is was essential, you know, uh, reform. So we did the right thing. Then people said, okay, now Brazil's gonna put Lula back or 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 whoever Lula says, you know, it's gonna go back to, to crazy expansions, put, put people put Bolsonaro there. Uh, then people said, no, but Bolsonaro is not. Paulo Guedes, you know, Paulo Guedes is the Levy of Bolsonaro. You know, Bolsonaro is do, gonna go, do crazy things. So he put Bo Paulo Guedes as Minister of Economy, which is Minister of Finance, Planning, Labor, Social Security, and I'm missing on industry. Uh, so it's, and I said, okay, Bolsonaro always voted against social security reform. So he's not gonna send social security reform to Congress. He sent it and he approved the uh, uh, social security reform of 800 million uh, billion savings in 10 years, double the size of the proposal of uh, of President Temer. Then they said, uh, "Okay, Bolsonaro uh, is a is a union leader. Uh, is not going to send you no know, administrative reform to Congress. He sent administrative reform to Congress. So every turn that we have had in the recent past since uh, Temer, you know, seems that we we debate, we try all the, all the all the crazy alternatives, but we." Don't, end up doing the a reasonable thing in terms of uh, of, uh, 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 of government expenditures of fiscal responsibility. So I, I'm, I'm hoping, I would say hoping is what we can say right now and, and have some rationale to think a little bit, but you know, this rationale is always very, very uh, fluid, you know, but I, I, I'm hoping that, you know, we are gonna take the right turn again uh, after this debate. Right. Comes. Right. No, thank you. Thank you. That, 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 those are, it's an important thing to keep in mind. I mean, you know, everything always in the, in the end, uh, it, it survives. I mean, I think that what we are discussing along here, uh, nobody, I think, it, it imagines a collapse. But the question is the costs of going through these transitions. Um, uh, John, is Danny back on or shall yeah. we? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, please, Danny. Okay. So, so uh, okay. So one one important observation is is uh, which is also very healthy to the market is we have seen a very clear breakdown between FX and equities in Brazil, right? Um, um, you know, again, Ibovespa is now at a hundred thousand, give or take, right? Where dollar Brazil has depreciated significantly more and has stayed at that level. Um, so, so there is clearly a divergence between uh, how asset prices have been behaving in Brazil itself. Um, uh, one additional point that would be very critical um, is that is domestic demand for dollars in Brazil, right? So um, um, the, the, the key source of dollar demand in Brazil today is not foreign investors, right? It's coming from Brazilians themselves, right? Um, and, and the Brazilians themselves are uh, uh, less in love with the DI product, right? And for obvious reasons, because the front end is very low, right? They don't want to take the duration exposure because of the issuance. And as a result, they go for uh, two options, either low, uh, equities or foreign investors. Um, this is not going to go away. Right. And and it's it's really important. And I think that it's a diversification that we could see 
I, I think, you know, no one really knows exactly what the weighting is, but I, I guess Brazilians weight of foreign assets in their portfolios is somewhere around 20%. Uh, my best guess is that it could go easily to 25 or 30%, right? Um, as a result of higher inflation. Um, so that is also a fairly healthy uh, 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 dynamics, right? It's, it's a good thing. It's not a bad thing that we should keep in mind. And, uh, and as a result, we might see that this administration just again, utilizing that exchange rate undervaluation to continue to pro progress in the reforms. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's an important point. I think that uh, all of asset managers all over the world, but particularly in Brazil, are having to make tough decisions. And, and clearly, uh, I think you're right. I think this, this whole diversification of, of big asset managers is ongoing and, and what they'll do will matter tremendously. Uh, Chris, Politics always has the last word, and you'll have the last word. Any any additional, nothing that you have heard since made you change your mind? Yeah, no, uh, no, thanks, Paulo. I mean, I would kind of just conclude, at least on my end, with two two comments. Um, the first is to reinforce something that Zena actually reacted to from my, uh, from my comments, which I would agree, which is that we will be in an intrinsically noisy process of figuring out how to fund a new social welfare program to substitute the, the auxiliary benefit in which all the actors are testing the limits of fiscal responsibility, right? So there will be trial balloons. There could be more scares in the market. That will be part of the decision-making process in Congress and the administration and the economic team over, over what are potential mechanisms to be able to, to come out of this. Um, it's not going to be resolved by December. <laughs> I think the debate will roll over into January. Uh, you know, Rodrigo Maia and Davi Columbia will probably have to call Congress an extraordinary session because there's just enough time to conclude this uh, before the end of the year. Uh, you're not going to vote the budget by the end of the year, so you're going to have to vote the budget probably rolling in the beginning of next year. So I think that that kind of, let's say, market constraints will be a key variable as the politicians figure out what's feasible and potential to get vote. I, I do think that a fiscal reform will get approved. Um, I think it will be a step forward, but it could be a noisy process from here to there. And and uh, and, and I think there is enough in Congress to, in terms of the productivity agenda and on the fiscal front, at least to be able to vote. So you don't need to send new proposals, right? The second point is we should also keep an eye on the global backdrop because Brazil has a, you know, everybody laid out very well the nature of Brazil's fiscal vulnerabilities. They, are, they, they kind of spent more than their peers and they're gonna finish with a higher debt burden. And what, what we see politically is a very gradual fiscal adjustment over time, okay? If you have a benign global backdrop, you could potentially execute that plan. But if the global backdrop for geopolitical reasons, either in the Biden administration, US-China relationships or whatever it is that generate a more negative global backdrop, then the bar for adjustments will rise and maybe the potential mismatch between politics on the ground and the requisites to stabilize, let's say, um, market expectations may rise further. So I think that, I think it is, it is important that you have benign global uh, uh, conditions to be able to do this gradual adjustment. We were, we're all talking about assuming a benign global backdrop, is there a mismatch between the politics and the gradual adjustment or not? I think that there probably is enough alignment in a noisy process. But if the global backdrop turns negative, then obviously the political equation becomes more, more challenging. Thank you, Chris. And, and I, um, I know uh, we are already um, uh, somewhat over our time, but I, and, and I, I would leave it up to you, John, but I, I don't really think we have time for Q&A unless you have a very pressing uh, question. Well, I uh, think for you're... myself, I just would like to thank everyone, uh, the audience, and particularly all of the participants uh, for, for coming here. I'm, I'm uh, moving out of this, and, and I leave it up to John to make the, uh, the adjustments and the decisions on, on when to cut us off. Thank you, and thank you, everyone, and be well. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, all the panelists, for a great panel. I think we had two questions from the from the attendees, um, but uh, Chris got to some of it and the other one was for the first panel. So we'll, we'll leave it, we'll, we'll answer those questions by email uh, and uh, we have the, a recording of who they are. Um, 
thank you again, Paul. Thank you, panelists. Fantastic two sets of uh, uh, two panels. And once again, thank you to HSBC and Bank of America for sponsorship. Before I close, I wanted to remind attendees that we return tomorrow at 9 a.m., Wednesday, the 21st of October, when we will have our second keynote speaker, Chaim Israel, Managing Director and Global Strategist at Bank of America. Mr. Mr. Israel brings a global respect, perspective on a wide variety of issues, and we ex we have, we're excited to have him as a speaker. And today was absolutely fabulous. So thank you all again.